We're going to deal with connected particles, section 10.5, and this is often seen as the hardest part of the mechanics on the year 12 course. Now, it's not as hard as people often think it is. The reason it's seen as difficult is because the examples at first are difficult. When you do enough of them, you should be able to see that they fit into a few categories. And the categories they fit into are ones like example 11, which I call the sort of car and caravan kind of problems, where we've got an object here pulling another object using a tow rope. <coughs> there are what I call lift questions, uh, which are ones like this. So here, here we've got uh, a scale pan, and when they say a scale pan, what they mean is an old-fashioned set of uh, weighing scales, you know, so uh, we've got that and it's, uh, you know, is the thing on this side equal in weight to the thing on this side? So a scale pan is like that, right? We've, so we've got an object on the scale pan and it's held up by a rope, and you can see that's perhaps a bit similar to having somebody standing in a lift or an elevator, right? So that's example number two is elevator style question and then there are pulley questions and the pulley questions are divided into two kinds of questions example 13 you've got an object on either side here's a pulley and then there's two objects hanging vertically one on either side of the pulley and the other example that we see a lot is example 14 we've got something sitting on a table and the rope goes over the pulley and there's an object hanging off the side of the table <clears throat> and when we get into year 13 we'll see examples where instead of hanging on a horizontal table we'll have an object standing on a slope and then the rope goes over a pulley and there's a, an object hanging down the other side okay but that's for the future for the moment examples 11 12 13 and 14 really deal with everything we need to know now there's a couple of reasons people find this difficult firstly you need to get yourself into the habit of seeing all the questions as one of those four examples it really is one of those four examples all the time. And when it isn't, it's become something else. It's become a SUVAC question or something like that. So for example, just thinking ahead a little bit, if we have a, um, a pulley, this is probably the easiest example. If we've got a pulley, and let's say it's accelerating in this direction, right? So it's moving this way. So this is the heavier object, this is the lighter object, and this thing is accelerating that way. If I were to cut that string, well, what happens is this whole bit disappears and this object here would start moving. We'd know the speed it started moving at and it's uh, now the only thing that's causing it to accelerate is the acceleration due to gravity or little g, right? So we'd use SUVAT, U-V-A-S-T, and we'd work out the, uh, the, the, the equation of this object moving under gravity. If it was this object here, when I cut the string, this object is moving upwards with a certain velocity, so it's going to go up and then back down. And again, that's a SUVAC question. <clears throat> so what you find is that often people think they're getting stuck on the connected particles chapter, and actually the thing that's making you stuck is that it's turned into a SUVAC question and you never noticed. And once you realise that you can solve the question from that point using SUVAC, then things get easier, okay? With connected particles, there is one big idea, and it's in the bullet point here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically read this bullet point to you and then we'll go through the examples and I'll show you how you can use those to solve pretty much every question in the book. It's not a good uh, topic to read from the blue boxes, by the way, and I'll explain why as we get going. So if you've got connected particles, you can consider the particles separately. If they're moving in the same straight line in the same direction, you can consider them as a single particle. OK, and that's the whole principle. That's the whole of the theory that we don't know so far. Let's have a look at the actual example and see how it works. <clears throat> so, if we've got a car and caravan problem, we've got, um, and I'll stick to the same lettering as, as in example 11 here, we've got P and Q, we've got a rope between them, or it might be a tow bar between them, and P is pulling Q along, all right? So P has got some sort of driving force. Now, if P is pulling Q along, this rope is pulling backwards on P, okay? So imagine you're in a car, you're driving along, and if you're in the same car with a caravan, the caravan is pulling backwards, it's slowing down the car, isn't it, okay? That if you put the same amount of, uh, of effort through the engine, if, if the engine's doing the same amount of work, but there's a caravan on the back, the acceleration is not gonna be as much. So the, the, the force provided by the caravan comes through the tow bar, 
and it's going to slow P down and that's going to be a tension. And then if you're in the caravan and there's no car, it's not going to move. If the car is attached, then it's going to pull the caravan forward. The only way the caravan gets to move is because it's being pulled through the tow rope or the tow bar. And there it is, uh, a tension there. <clears throat> so there's a driving force from the car. There's a tension pulling the car backwards. There's a tension pulling the caravan forwards. There might, the, the, there's a friction force pulling the car backwards and there's a friction force pulling the caravan backwards. Now this friction force here and this friction force here might be different forces. In some questions you might have a smooth surface, so you're going to ignore the friction force, but in the real world they'll both be there. What we often get in the questions is there is a, a resistance to motion force. So we get the air resistance and the friction from the road all lumped into one and we get given a force here. Okay? The car has got a mass on it and the caravan has got a mass and these things aren't accelerating down into the road, so there must be something balancing out these downward forces, and that's the normal reaction from the road on the car and the normal reaction from the road on the caravan, okay? Those are the forces that we typically have involved. Um, one more thing quickly, actually, while I remember it. If this is a rope instead of a tow bar, the difference is if P were to stop suddenly, then this rope would go slack and Q would just carry straight on, wouldn't it? And, uh, and then it would be, again, it would be moving under SUVAT equations. There'd be no forward driving force, there'd be a friction force pushing it backwards. Um, so you could use F equals MA to find the acceleration. And then once you know the acceleration, you could use SUVAT to see how long it would take Q to stop, you know, if P suddenly vanished, something like that. Um, if this is not a rope, but a tow bar, then if P suddenly stops, Instead of this rope going slack, it's a tow bar, so it's going to be a, a solid bar. So if Q keeps moving forward, it's going to be pushing through the tow bar on P. Uh, and in fact, there's a question like that in one of the exercises where um, P breaks, and then that means that the caravan is pushing forward on, the, on, uh, on P instead of there being a tension force pulling the, the, the caravan forward. Uh, instead of this tension force and the thing pulling the car backwards and the, pulling the caravan forward, the fact that there's a tow bar there when P breaks means that the tow bar starts pushing forward on P. Um, to see that, imagine, you, you know, you imagine you're in a car and you brake, and then you imagine you're in the same car and you brake, and there's a caravan behind you and you're moving at speed. You're going to brake, uh, you're going to decelerate not as quickly because there's a caravan pushing you forward, isn't there? Okay? So um, there's a difference between a tow bar and a tow rope. Bear that in mind, but <clears throat> with that one exception, this is the setup that we get, okay? Now, in the example that we've got in example 11, we could read through it and see that these masses are called P and Q and they're five and three, but just, uh, I'll, I'll stick with the same numbers. I could put any old numbers on here. It really doesn't matter. Um, but the way that the, uh, I'll stick with the way that they've labeled them the same as, as in the book. Um, 3G, we've got six there, we've got 10 there, we've got 40 here. Okay, and all of these are measured in Newtons. In the book, they've put the N in for Newtons. I'm going to miss the N out for the moment. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different forces going on there. And maybe we stick another one in. You know, I don't know, maybe there's, there's something pulling behind the caravan or, the, or there's an extra force for some reason on the front of the car. I don't know. They could throw the odd extra force in, but almost always, this is all the forces that we're going to deal with. Okay? Now, this is what we do, almost irrespective of what the question is. I, I always say to my classes, it's, it's almost worth writing these equations down before you've even read what they're asking you to do. Read the description, and then before you read part A, B, C, write the, well, you know, you can write the equations down. It's almost worth doing that, of course, practically. Just have a look and see what they're trying to find. Um, I said it's not a good topic to learn from the blue boxes, and that's because in the blue box, straight away they know what to do right in part a they deal with the whole system and they you know they, they, they know what order the equations come in when you're actually doing a question you don't know what order these equations come in we're just going to write them all down and see what happens okay so first of all we're going to consider as it says in the uh, in the bullet point in bold there consider the particles separately and then if they're moving the same straight line we can consider them as a single particle so let's deal with them separately first of all right let's consider p we can deal with the vertical forces, we can deal with the horizontal forces. In practice, this is horizontal motion. There's very rarely going to be any acceleration vertically here, right? If you've got a car going along a road, it doesn't take off and it doesn't accelerate downwards into the road. But for the completeness, for the theory, we can consider the vertical motion. Now, vertically, we're resolving 
because there is no acceleration vertically. So we get that R2 equals 5g. So we can call that equation number one if we want. Um, the other thing we can do at P is we can consider the horizontal motion. And in uh, this case, we're going to apply F equals ma because there is an acceleration in the system. How do I know there's an acceleration? Because it tells me in the question, find the acceleration. If there's not an acceleration, somewhere in the question it will be saying something like, the car's moving at a constant speed. Okay, so uh, you know whether you're resolving forces or whether you're applying F equals ma. Now, <clears throat> when we're going to consider just P, let's literally take a piece of paper, or anything you like, cover it up with your hand, cover up the rest of it, we're just considering the forces on P. So vertically, that was easy. Horizontally, what have we got? Well, 40 pushes forward, 10 pushes backwards, T pushes backwards. So that is my F. Remember, F is the resultant force, not just the driving force. Watch out for that. It's an error a lot of people make. The force is the resultant force. In F equals MA, F is the resultant force, not just the driving force. So 10 pushes forward, T pushes backwards, 10 pushes backwards. F equals mass which it tells me in the question is five kilograms. That's why I've got a five G force here. If uh, times acceleration, and I don't know the acceleration, so I'm just gonna leave it in as A. That's another equation. Let's call that equation number two. <clears throat> We've considered P. At Q. Now, let's cover up P. Let's just deal with Q. Vertically, we can resolve. So R1 is going to equal 3G. I'm going to call that equation number 3. At Q, horizontally, we're going to apply F equals MA. Looking at just the forces that are here, T is pulling it forward. 6 is pushing it backwards. Equals the mass, which is 3, times the acceleration, which is A. I'm going to call that equation number 4. Let's look at these equations. The tension is the same all the way through this tow bar because it's a light and extensible string, right? Or it's, it's modeled as a light and extensible string. Those modeling assumptions make it the same tension all the way through. The acceleration of the car and the acceleration of the caravan have to be the same because this thing is taut here. Uh, so if the, once this string is taut or this tow bar is taut, once P moves, Q moves straight away. If P speeds up, Q speeds up, right? The car and the caravan are moving with the same speed at all points, so they're moving with the same acceleration. If the speed's changing, the speed's changing for both of them in the same way, so the acceleration's the same. So these two equations I can solve simultaneously. And in fact, this all of these situations, all of these equations here, we might have to solve them all simultaneously. Practically speaking, this one we don't usually bother writing down. This one we don't usually bother writing down. For the theory, I'm showing you that you can deal with vertical and horizontal forces. Because in year 13, we need to get into the habit of thinking vertically, thinking horizontally, thinking if we're in equilibrium vertically, we resolve. If we're accelerating vertically, we apply F equals MA. If we're in equilibrium horizontally, we resolve, uh, as in balance the forces out. If we're, in, if we're not in equilibrium horizontally, we apply F equals MA. So we've got two equations. We've got number two and number four which we're going to mostly, we'll write that one down first, this one down second, and we'll call them one and two. I'm putting these in for the example. Now, <clears throat> the thing that we haven't done is this. Consider this whole thing as a single particle. If I consider the whole thing as a single particle, I'll have a new diagram, which is, you know, one object that's moving, and inside, you know, the, the, think about this as, as though it's all glued together. It's all one thing, and it's a car and a caravan, right? So we've got one big object here, it's got 5g weight from the, by the way, this g here is 9.8, right? It's the acceleration due to gravity. It's not a unit, it's 5 times g. Um, so it's 5g pulling down and 3g pulling down. So there's 8g pulling down um, because the total mass is 5 plus 3. The total mass is 8 kilograms, right? There's a, an overall reaction force pushing up. Pulling forward, there's a driving force of 40. Pushing backwards, there is this frictional force and this frictional force. <clears throat> These tension forces, there's one pulling backwards, there's one pulling forwards. So when we're considering the whole thing, there's a tension going forward and tension going backwards and they wipe each other out. Or you can think of it as this is inside the whole system, right? This is, we're, consider, we're zooming out, we're considering the car and the caravan as one particle together. So a force that's inside that system sort of doesn't count. So if you imagine you've got two people inside the car, um, 
um, they're sort of playing tug of war inside the car, that's not going to make any difference to the acceleration of the whole car. There, there are forces involved coming forwards and backwards, but it's not going to make any difference to the uh, to the there's a force pushing forward, which is, which is the driving force of the car. There's a friction force on the road pulling it backwards. People inside the car aren't going to make a difference to that. In the same way, the tension of the tow rope isn't going to make a difference when we're considering the particle, the, the whole system as one particle. So for the whole particle, uh, we've drawn a new diagram. Vertically, we can resolve and get R equals 8G. Horizontally, we can apply F equals MA and we get 40 minus 16 equals mass, which is 8, times acceleration, which is A. That's equation number 5, that's equation number 6. Practically speaking, we're not going to worry about the vertical forces very often unless we get a question which seems to be really trying to involve them. Practically speaking, we will draw this diagram. We will write down this equation, this equation, and this equation, and then look at the equations. Here, what have we got? The only things that are missing in this equation are t and a. The only things that are missing in this equation are t and a. So if I do those two things first, I've got two simultaneous equations, I've got two unknowns, I should be able to solve that and find t and a. If I go ahead and write the third equation down there, I've got an equation with only one missing thing, and that's an a. So just from this equation, I can find a, and then I can take it and substitute it into these two, because this a here is the same as these two a's here, right? I've got three equations, I write down those three equations and I solve those three equations simultaneously or maybe I deal with them one at once. From reading this question, there's nothing obvious, certainly not at first, when you've got a bit of experience maybe you'll start thinking ahead a little bit, but there's no reason on this question to consider the whole system first. The people that wrote this textbook, I would guess, solved this question, worked out that when they wrote down those three equations, this one did the job of finding the acceleration. Once they know that, then they go back and write the blue box. And the problem about that is that when you read the blue box, you think, oh, right, so I'll consider the whole system first. How did I know to consider the whole system? Why didn't I consider just P? Why didn't I consider just Q first? And the answer is, it's fine, because do all three. Before you do anything, write down all three equations. The numbers are going to change, but if you've got a car and caravan problem, you basically got these forces. Sometimes it's a smooth road, so you can take the forces out, uh, the, re the resistance forces out. Sometimes the cars just stop driving, right? So there's only the resistance forces and this whole thing's slowing down. But really, uh, it's those forces. Same question with different numbers. You write down those three equations, look at the equations, there'll be two or three pieces of information missing. You solve those three, simultaneous, three equations simultaneously and you find those three missing pieces of information. That is how you solve pretty much all of these questions. Well, in fact, all of these questions. If they get anything that's more difficult than that, then you're probably getting into the realms of using a bit of SUVAT or maybe you've just got to think carefully about what would really happen in real life, right? So um, the example I talked about before where if you've got a tow bar instead of a rope, that sort of thing. A um, <clears throat> couple of other things to say. Firstly... Uh, if you haven't watched any of the other videos, I'm quite fussy about resolve and F equals MA. I like to res reserve the word resolve for situations where we're in equilibrium and the forces balance out. And I call that resolving and I call F equals MA uh, what's happening. If it's accelerating, we apply F equals MA. Uh, a lot of people are happy with the word resolve, even if the system's actually accelerating. I prefer resolve to mean um, if we're in equilibrium. Secondly, these lines here are super important. If you just wrote down these, this equation here in an exam, so you know, let's imagine we're in an exam, we wouldn't bother with that one because we know we're only dealing horizontally, we'd write this down first. If you just wrote that down, <clears throat> the examiner doesn't know if you're considering forces of P or Q, if you're thinking vertically or horizontally, if you're considering both particles together or one particle at once. So if you make any mistakes in here, they can't give you some marks because they, they, didn't, they don't know whether you were trying to resolve forces of P. There will often be in the mark scheme, it will say one mark for correct method to uh, write down the equation of motion of P considered separately. If you do this, they know that that's what you're trying to do. So you might get the method marks just for writing this down. That's going to be a bit lucky, to be honest. You're probably going to have to get the, some of the equation at least right as well. But at least they know that this equation is supposed to be 
the equation of motion for P. You need to tell them you're working horizontally and not vertically. It's a good habit to get into because later on we're going to need the vertical equations as well. Uh, when, and as I say, mostly when we get to year 13, but get into that habit now. You need to tell us you're working at P and you need to explain to me that you're applying F equals MA, you're not balancing the forces out, okay? <clears throat> so that line there is super important, but you can use those shorthands at P, working horizontally, apply F equals MA. That's perfectly fine if you're in an exam situation. It's a bit nicer if you actually write the sentence out, but that's perfectly fine as a shorthand. Label your equations, and when you move on from there, so if you're in an exam, if I was in an exam, the way I would answer this question would be, like that, I wouldn't bother with those three vertical ones. My next line after that would be, from equation six, we've got 40 minus 16 equals 8a, so 40 minus 16 I can work out, right? That's, uh, oh dear me, I can't work it out. Uh, 40 minus 16 is 26 equals, um, oh, for goodness sake, I really can't work it out. 24 equals 8a, so a equals three. You must tell me that, you, that this information comes from equation six, and then you need to tell me what you're gonna do with that. You can't just say, oh, so therefore, t minus six equals nine. From here to here, that's, that doesn't make sense. Where did you get this information from? Where I got it from was, I substituted a equals three into equation four. And when I look at equation four, it's t minus six equals three a, so t minus six equals three times three, t minus six equals nine. If I hadn't got that line in, this line doesn't make sense. A equals three, therefore t minus six equals nine. If I've got a full page of algebra, what, where did I get this from? A equals three, substitute that into equation four. That gives you t minus six equals nine. And that's gonna give us our t equals 15, okay? Um, I've been a bit shoddy there. I've forgotten my units on the answers. Okay, so that's the first of four examples. Uh, quite a long video because I've done all the introduction as well. So I'll stop and we'll do example 12 in the next video.